All right, Sean, we are going to skip the intro this week. We're going to do something a little bit different. So this will be the section where you sort of paste in the beautiful theme song that we have. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. I'm Joshua Fields Milburn, and we're doing this a bit different today. I'm by myself. Ryan is on vacation, sort of. His family's in town. Uh, He has like eight people staying in his tiny little apartment, which is hilarious. Uh, He and Mariah and like his entire side of his mother's family. And we are doing this live on Periscope right now, uh, as well as we'll post this up on on the podcast later, hopefully, if it goes well. If not, you will never hear this other than on Periscope. So welcome, y'all. Now, I won't be looking at a lot of the questions here on Periscope, but because I already have a ton of questions from people. And I this is a little bit different because I'm not doing any prep work for this one. Usually, Ryan and I prepare for... I don't know, four to six hours for a podcast. Uh, we'll prepare the day before and then the morning of the podcast and and not prepare our answers, but we'll do some research. We will we'll do some talking and we'll, we'll do some different things to try to make sure that we're ready to record on a particular subject. As most of you have probably noticed, many of our podcast episodes will center around a particular theme or motif. So whether it's decluttering or sentimental items or relationships or whatever, this one's a bit different. This is just going to be a solo episode with me, and I'm going to answer a bunch of random questions that were selected very randomly here, uh, both voicemails and from uh, social media. Before we get started, though, a little bit of housekeeping Ryan and I are taking this podcast on the road in May, and I am so excited about that. I know Ryan is too. We're going to be in more than a dozen cities. We'll be in New York City on May 1st, 2016. And from there, we're going to be in Boston and Washington, D.C. and Miami and Dallas and Dayton, Ohio, back in our hometown for a day. And then we'll be in Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Missoula, Montana, and our, our current hometown. And then we're going to finish the tour in Canada, in Toronto, Canada, actually. And so we're going to be doing that all throughout May, May 1st to June 1st. We're bringing our documentary with us as well. It's called Minimalism, a documentary about the important things. And you can join us uh, for that. We're going to screen the documentary. We're going to do a live Q&A session. Uh, We're going to record it for the podcast. And uh, we'll, of course, do our favorite part, which is dishing out tens of thousands of hugs throughout the throughout the, the, the tour, a- after all of our Q&A and everything. So we have a bunch of people on, on Periscope and Twitter who are watching us right now, or I should say watching me right now. There's a microphone in front of my face, so um, it's probably a better view than if it was just me staring at a camera. So um, I'm going to move on to our first voicemail question, and this one is from Catherine. I am one of the few people who is lucky enough to work in the industry that I also am passionate about. However, the problem is, is that when I get home from my daily grind at the office from eight to five to come home and my passion project is the same thing that I've just spent the last 10 hours working on. I have a hard time being motivated to work on my passion project because it utilizes the same skill set. Do you guys have any advice? So any advice about your passion project? Really, I think the question, maybe if I were to rephrase the question a bit, is can you get burned out on your passion? And the answer is absolutely yes. You, you, you certainly can. And, and that means you don't have enough balance at times. And I think we, we all struggle with this, especially uh, me, because if I get really passionate about something, that comes after all of the excitement. So maybe I've been excited about a, a topic or, or something for a while, but I've drudged through the drudgery, and now I'm starting to get this payoff, and it feels very meaningful. It's a purpose-driven work. Work. And, and I think that's awesome. But we also have to take time to balance out our life. And our first book, and so Catherine, I'm going to send you a copy of our first book, uh, which is 
is uh, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. And in that book, we talk about the five values of uh, uh, living a, a more deliberate, more intentional life. And only one of those is, is passion. But there are four other values as well. And, and the problem is, if we get too focused on one thing, one, one bucket of those five buckets, one area, we, just, we call them values. If we get too focused on one value in life, what happens is we forsake the other values. And we're only as strong as our, our, our weakest value. And so just going through those five values real quick, health, relationships, passion, growth, contribution. So you see, you can have four of those buckets where you're really focused on them. Let's say you're really focused on your passion project. Everything's going awesome and and you're, you're knocking it out of the park. You feel like all of your work is so purposeful that you have a sense of autonomy, autonomy, you are mastering what you're doing and you're making good money, you know, whatever. That's great. But Let's say you're also you know, really focused on your relationships and your marriage is going well and all of a sudden you, know, you feel like your friends that you've surrounded yourself with share your similar values, they share similar interests. That's great. Let's say you feel like you're growing because of your relationships and also your, your uh, uh, passion and, and you're doing new things in life. You've, you're making yourself uncomfortable so you're able to grow. And you're also contributing to your community, which makes you feel wonderful because, of course, giving is living. But let's say you don't have that first value in place. Let's say your health is really struggling and you're eating fast food every day because that's easier. You're not taking the time to work out. You're not taking the time to connect with your body. Well, yeah, you're going, you're going to feel like something is missing and you're going to burn yourself out. And so it's really about achieving balance and mastering all five areas. And it may mean, it doesn't mean focusing on all five at, at the same exact moment, but every day I will try to do something that is really really focused on one of those areas and, and then focus on all of them throughout the day. And the best way I found to do that is ask myself with whatever I'm doing, whether it's you know, uh, browsing Facebook or spending time with, with close friends or recording a podcast, I, I ask myself, and what values does this serve? And if you ask that question enough, you'll, you'll learn that it becomes habitual. And if you're serving more than one value, that's even better, right? Because as I'm recording this podcast, I'm certainly growing. We, we have a... We, we have an uh, innate desire to grow. And I am uncomfortable recording a podcast, especially doing it live like we're doing right now on Periscope and, and Twitter. And so... I am not necessarily comfortable doing this, but because I have put myself in a position of discomfort, that is a position from which I grow the most. I also feel like I'm able to contribute because I'm able to share my sort of uh, knowledge that I've gained over time with regards to minimalism or life experience. I'm able to share that with other people, so I'm able to contribute to the world around me in a meaningful way. So I'm fulfilling a couple of different values there as well. As soon as I finish this uh, recording this podcast, I'm going to go for a long walk because it's finally sunny here in beautiful Missoula, Montana, which is where I'm at right now. And, and so I'm going to go for a walk, which aids my health. You know, I can also do some something meditative while I'm walking, uh, which is a different type of health, you know, mental health, you might say, or removing mental clutter. Uh, I might also listen to a podcast or some music, find a way to, to grow in that way, learn something new. Our next question is from Rigel. I am going to be starting up uh, college next year, so I would kind of I would kind of like to hear your perspective on that. Um, it's going to be a big transition period. Um, I would, I kind of like to hear what would be a good way to stay minimalist during college, um, while keeping track of assignments, keeping track of, you know, old papers and textbooks and, um, you know, the busy lifestyle that, um, you kind of have to face during college. So, you know, what, what would be a good way to be able to stay um, keep, keep living a minimal lifestyle um, during that. Rigel, the first thing you're going to have to do is realize there are going to be tools that are going to augment your experience, whether it's college or moving into the workforce or going on a camping trip or going skiing. There are tools that can actually help our experience be better. And so minimalism is not about deprivation. 
Minimalism is about finding the right tools, the appropriate tools for the task at hand. Ryan often talks about how he is he's a snowboarder, right? He loves snowboarding, goes snowboarding all the time. And so in order to do that, it'd be pretty difficult to do without uh, the appropriate equipment. He needs a snowboard. He, need, he needs the sort of accoutrement that goes with, w- with snowboarding. Now, if I had those same trinkets, that's all they would be to me, or trinkets. I would have a, 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 a snowboard in a closet somewhere. I'm not going to use it. I don't go snowboarding personally. I've tried, and I, I don't enjoy it, and I've actually injured myself doing that. And so you know, for me, it, it's really about figuring out what tools are appropriate. Now, once you've determined that, it doesn't mean that you're going to be right 100% of the time. Sometimes you're going to bring tools in, you realize, I don't actually need this. And then it's about finding it a new home, finding someone else who can get value from that thing. Also, uh, with respect to minimalism and applying minimalism to the college life or any other lifestyle, I find that the best way to do it is to bring as few things in as possible especially once we've cleared the clutter from our lives. The, the average American household has more than 300,000 items in it. And, and it's up to us to, to clear the excess out of the way. But once we've cleared the excess, it's just as important, if not more important, to stop the excess from being excess before it even comes into our lives. That's the easiest way to deal with it. Because you're not going to have to declutter those hundred things if you've brought in only 10 of the hundred that you might have, might have brought in. So you bring in things deliberately into your life. There are a few ways to do that. Start to ask some questions. Does this thing add value to my life? Is this appropriate for my life? Is this a tool? Is it going to serve a purpose? Is it going to bring me joy? And the cool thing about that is it changes over time. And so minimalists aren't against consumption. We're against compulsory consumption. So we are going to bring things into our lives. And as our circumstances change, our, our, our tools will change as well. I was uh, I was shopping this weekend with uh, with Becca. We were getting a, a new high chair for um, for Ella. We were actually out in in um, Seattle this weekend, and while we were there, we we stopped at IKEA. Which, uh, if anyone knows me or has read everything that remains, which is the memoir that Ryan and I wrote, there's a whole sort of dissertation about IKEA. In fact, that dissertation made it into our documentary. Uh, so, Rigel, actually, you're in Tucson. Uh, good news for you. We have a, a screening of our documentary uh, in, coming up in Tucson, and I'd love to send you a, a couple tickets to that documentary so you can you can see my disdain for the impulsive purchase of. Uh, of items, but someone recognized me, Sean, when I was at, at IKEA th- this weekend, and uh, it makes it easier if I have someone to talk to. So I'm just talking to Sean here. Um, he's our, our our trustful, trustworthy, and 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 astute producer of of the podcast. Uh, anyway, I was at IKEA this weekend buying a new high chair for for Ella. And um, someone recognized me, and he, he pulled me up on the phone. Is, is, is this you? And I'm like, Yeah, it's me. And, and I'm like, I swear, I'm just, I'm shopping for a friend, you know? Because, but here here's the truth. Like we we go. There's nothing inherently wrong with IKEA or anything else. Uh, the problem, and I, I wrote about this, and in, in everything that remains is the time that I first discovered minimalism was in a very difficult. Uh, time in my life. Uh, my mom had died and my marriage ended both in the same month. And oh, I, I, you know, instead of dealing with those things head on, which is the appropriate way to deal with it, I found myself trying to mask and cover up the problem with, with buying uh, trinkets and, and buying what I'm supposed to buy. Because my marriage ended, so I moved into a new apartment. And, and the line from the book is, while Rome is burning... There's somehow time for shopping at IKEA. And, and I found myself like buying all these things that you're supposed to buy. And there's nothing wrong with the stuff. The, the question was, I wasn't questioning what I was bringing into my life. Oh, I'm supposed to have this uh, throw pillow. I'm supposed to have this couch and a love seat and a chair and a desk and a, a desk chair and a, and a lamp and another lamp for over there. And, and all of these things that you're supposed to have. And there's nothing wrong with a lot of those things. I have... You know, plenty of things. I have a bath rug. It's okay to have that. The question is, 
am I actually questioning bringing this into my life or am I just bringing it into my life because that's what I'm supposed to do? So, Rigel, I would encourage you to ask those questions as you're bringing those things in. Is this actually going to be useful? Is this going to serve a purpose what I'm going to do? Is this going to make my experience better? And don't just justify it. You know what? You have to be honest with yourself. And, and maybe the way to be honest with yourself, if you're not sure, is to just say, I don't know. Let me go without it for a little bit. Temporary deprivation to see what whether or not I'm actually going to need this. So give yourself a time period, a week, uh, two weeks, a month, whatever it may be. And I do that with most big purchases. Anything over 100 bucks, I, I tend to wait 30 days before I'm going to, to purchase it. I know other people, it's 20 bucks. If I, I'm not, not going to spend more than $20 on this thing if, uh, if I haven't at least ruminated on it for, for a month. So, Rigel, we're going to send you a couple tickets to the Tucson screening of... Uh, minimalism, a documentary about the important things. And for anyone else who's, who's listening and wants to find the, the theater closest to them, because we're showing in uh, 400 theaters starting May 24th, 2016, you can just go to minimalismfilm.com and uh, click on See the Film, and you can find a theater closest to you. Now, he- here's the deal with that. It is showing usually in most cities for one night only. Uh, sometimes it may do more than one night, but Honestly, and, and most realistically, if it doesn't get enough showings in, in one one night, it's not going to show for weeks and weeks. Now, if you help it tip, meaning we have enough people who, who go see this, the film, then it will show for a longer duration. And for those of you overseas, don't worry. Uh, we are still working on overseas distribution. We're starting with Canada and Australia, and then we're going to see where else we can go from there. And eventually, we'll do an online online release of the film as well. Our next question is from Heather. My husband and I have actually recently started our minimalist journey, and we're doing great so far. Um, But my sister-in-law is getting married in a few months, and she is kind of expecting my husband and I to go into debt for her wedding. We are not quite sure how to tell her that we are not going to be doing that um, because we just can't afford to do it at this time. And as you guys say, no debt is good debt. So no debt is good debt. That, that's an interesting way. That, that's an interesting play on words, what our usual phrase is, right? Uh, I will say there is no such thing as good debt. No debt is good debt. I love that. That's like, I need to write that down for a blog post title uh, later. Uh, no, I, I, I do believe that, that there is no such thing as good debt. Now, there are times where going to debt may be necessary for a, a family member's wedding. That's certainly not one of them. Uh, the, the time that I can see where debt is most necessary is often when someone wants to get a mortgage, then I often rec- recommend if you can't pay cash for a house, which I, I can't right now, and that's why I rent personally. Uh, but I do recommend you know, a seven-year a, a fixed-rate mortgage and having 20 to 50% down if that is a, a good choice for you and your family. And you know you're going to be in the city for at least seven years. That's when it tends to make sense mathematically. Now, in terms of other debt, yes, there are some debts that are better than others. Uh, a student loan may be better than a, a payday loan. Actually, not maybe. It certainly is. Uh, although many student loans, I mean, if, if you know, we have something like 60% of people who actually finish college who, who start, then you know, many people, and myself included, I had six figures worth of debt. Some of that was student loans. Now, I don't have a college degree, but I had heaps of student loans. Now, I'll let you figure that out. But was that a, a good use of my money? Certainly not. I was paying off uh, something that I, I, I didn't actually have value in. And it's interesting. We do that with a lot of things. A lot of, a lot of people, myself included, have just endless numbers of credit cards, or I had endless numbers of credit cards. I had 14 credit cards. So I'd have the Banana Republic credit card or I would have the Best Buy credit card because you go somewhere and they're like, would you like to save 15% on this t-shirt? You're like, yeah, just fill out this piece of paper and, you, and, and it's crazy, but, but that's what we do. Uh, debt is, is not good because it traps us. It anchors us to obligations, obligations being an income, being a job, being a location. It, it anchors us in, in not a good way. When you think of anchors, we often hear that, oh my goodness, you are such an anchored person, like it's a compliment. But when you think about that, you flip it on its head, anchored really means what? It means that we are stuck. If you think of a ship that is anchored, it is, you've put an anchor down, it's at bay, 
It's keeping it from roaming the seas and being free. And so debt is the obverse side of freedom. And I found that by getting rid of debt, I, I didn't. I was almost 32 years old by the time I, I finally got out of debt. So it was even after I, I walked away from the corporate world. But I had to put a, a very uh, specific plan together. For those of you who are interested in reading that plan, you can find it at theminimalists.com slash freedom. It's a, it's a very long, very difficult plan. Uh, actually, but it's easy. Now, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not easy. It's simple. Simple is not easy. And, and, and that, that's the thing that I try to drive home with people. It's a fairly simple plan. I'll just go through a few things for the people who listen, and then I promise I will answer your question about going into debt for um, what you're trying to, to, to do in terms of this wedding. But uh, the, the essay itself that, that Ryan and I wrote, and uh, it, it's called Financial Freedom, Five Difficult Steps to Get Out of Debt, Create a Simple Budget, Plan for the Future, and Regain Control of Your Finances. These are all things that are important. Now, now there are two words that, that are in the title of that, five difficult steps, because I, I don't want to pretend that it's easy. It's not easy to get out of debt, but nothing that's really worth doing is, is, is easy. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not simple. Simple means that it's deliberate. Easy means it's the, the path of least resistance. And so we want to be careful when we, we confuse those two terms, and often they are used synonymously, but to me, they're, they're opposites from each other. They're antonyms because they, they mean two different things. Uh, it, going with the flow, I'm looking at a river out, out my window right now. In the summer, people are floating down this river at, all the time. They're going with the flow. Now that is easy right? Now, it's interesting because if they were to keep going with the flow here, there are some rapids that show up in about two miles from here. And that's the problem with, with continuing to go with the flow all the time. Eventually, you show up at the rapids, you show up at the falls. And if you don't have a plan because you've just been going with the flow the whole time, well, then you are in for a world of hurt. Now, simple is putting on your wetsuit, grabbing your wakeboard, and, and going down to those rapids, which I guarantee, that because it's sunny out there, people are doing that right now. And, and it's fairly simple, but, but it, is, it is not easy. It's a difficult task. And, and people are in the same body of water. Some people are taking it easy, and some people are taking it simple and, and enjoying that time and finding a meaningful experience in doing it. So in terms of going into debt, how do you communicate that you're not willing to go into debt? Uh, first off, you, you need to sit down with you and your husband and, and have that conversation together. And, and, and eventually, uh, you, you need to, to bring your family into the fold and say, you know, look, we are not willing to go into debt um, in order to, to you know, pay for your wedding. And, or, or to take the trip. I'm not really sure what the circumstances are surrounding that. But, but ultimately, it's not something that's in our budget right now. And, and the way to approach that is to say, I can't afford this, as opposed to saying, I don't want to go into debt for this. And, and I think it's distinctly different. Before I purchase something, uh, two questions that I ask is, is this going to add value to my life? And that's great if it will. Uh, but the second question is equally as important, is can I afford this? And what you're saying right now is you can't afford it. It's not about not going into debt. You don't have the capital or you're not willing to spend the capital. Maybe you have $100,000 in the bank and this wedding is going to cost you 20000 and you're saying, well, I'm not willing to take $20,000 out. And maybe that's the better question to ask yourself right now is if I had a hundred grand in the bank, would, would I still be willing to spend this five, 10, 20 grand? And if so, great. That means, yes, it would add value to your life. The second question is, can I afford this? And if you can't afford it, it's okay to say that you can't afford something. I just told you a minute ago, I can't afford to buy a house right now. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't feel ashamed to not be able to buy a house. Uh, I don't have the cash in the bank to do that. Now, could I finance a house? Of course, I have good credit. Uh, but I don't need good credit because I don't, I don't take loans out for anything now. I'm never going back into debt. So I, I think it's important to have that conversation early on and set that expectation. And, and don't, don't confuse your level of commitment or love or caring or, or compassion or empathy with, with what they're doing. Uh, 
don't confuse that with the monetary obligation of, of doing something else. And so having a conversation about whether or not you can afford it uh, is important. And if they suggest going into debt, just say, well, no, that doesn't align with my values. And, and I know that none of my friends or family would certainly ask me to do something that is against my values. Our next question is from Caitlin. I recently interviewed for a position and got offered a job, but it's taking a $9,000 pay cut per year, which is pretty significant. So I want to know what you think someone should do when they're trying to go after their dreams. Do you think that it's worth it to take that initial pay cut to end up being in an industry that you, you think will make you happy in the long run? Or do you think you have to be more financially savvy? Um, I do have student loan debt and credit card debt, and I've been able to pay a pretty good chunk every month of that. Uh, and by taking this pay cut, it would significantly reduce the amount that I can make payments on my credit cards, which is obviously a deterrent. But then again, I want to be happy. Uh, I want to start making my way into a position that will fulfill me in the in the end game. So you had me right up until the the, the debt part. I, I was so ready to jump in and say, yes. Yeah. So, so there are a few questions here that, that I think will be applicable to to a lot of different people here. Um, Caitlin, first off, in terms of, of finances, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, uh, Essential, because uh, there's an essay collection and it has 150 different essays, 12 different chapters. One of the chapters is on finances, and I think it'll help point you in the right direction in terms of money. So I'd love to send you a, a copy of, of that book. But until you get that, let me let me try to answer a few different questions here. You you have three different questions I want to I want to talk about. First one I want to talk about is should I switch careers or or jobs? And in our last podcast, we actually talked about the difference between a a job, a career, and a mission. So if you haven't listened to that yet, because it, you haven't, it hasn't come out yet. Um, uh, uh, well, by the time this sh- shows up on our podcast, it will. I'm talking to the folks here on Twitter and Periscope, but. Um, we, we delineate between a, a job, a career, and a mission. It sounds to me like you're moving from a career into something that is your mission, and that is awesome. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about what the right decision is in a moment. The second question you're asking is about, well, should I stay in this career for a while and pay off some debt? That, that is a really wonderful question because uh, uh, it means that you're not just making this knee-jerk reaction to go from one place to another. Now, the, the, the third thing I want to talk about is about happiness, and I'm going to start there. You, you said, because I want to be happy. I want you to realize something, that happiness isn't the point. Living a meaningful life is the point, and happiness is an important byproduct of that. The problem where we get caught is we often chase happiness, and the way we chase happiness is through things, through status, through trinkets, through promotions, through job titles, through sexual relationships, you know, we, we, all of these ephemeral things that aren't going to bring us lasting contentment. They'll bring us momentary joy, but they're not useful for our long term, and they're certainly not useful for the, the greater good of, of the world around us. And so they don't help us grow, they don't help us contribute, and so we feel the sense of discontent. And so meaningful life uh, includes those five values I mentioned earlier, but but the meaning of life is growth and contribution. Am I growing? Am I giving? And, and if I'm able to do that, ultimately happiness is going to be a byproduct of that. So I would much rather search for meaning than chase happiness. So, so keep that in mind. When you're asking these questions, is this going to be meaningful for me? That will lead to you, you to happiness, not in the moment, not in the ephemeral sense of happiness, but, but a lasting contentment, which will mean happiness in the moment as well, but not just in the moment. Now, in terms of whether you should make this career change, or I would say change toward your mission, uh, it, until you got to the debt part, I would, a- I would tell you to ask yourself this question. If you were in the opposite shoes, if you were already in this career that was, uh, or in, in this mission that was really fulfilling, you had this sense of autonomy and purpose and mastery, and, and you were moving in the right direction, you felt like you were growing, you were giving it your all, you were passionate about it, and it allowed you to balance out your life in a way that, that was truly me- meaningful. Would you want to switch careers for $9,000 more a year? 
And, and if so, why? So I certainly wouldn't. In fact, when I was in the corporate world, I was the director of operations for 150 retail stores, which I know sounds really impressive. That was that, that status uh, because I had this impressive job title. But I also didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't feel happy, but I also wasn't living a, a meaningful life. I wasn't focused on my values. I was focused on earning a paycheck. I was successful in the monetary sense. I was making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And when I walked away from that, I was making about 10% of what I was making. So a couple hundred thousand dollars to about twenty-seven thousand dollars when I when I walked away from that corporate world, but I found so much more meaning in the life that that I was experiencing afterward because I started to live in accordance with my values. My short-term actions matched my long-term values, and it seems to me that's the direction you're going in. Now I don't know your specific situation, uh, Caitlin, in terms of your debt. So it may mean sticking it out for a short period of time and having a plan to pay off those debts. And I think that's okay, uh, unless you don't have that, that option to, to stick it out where you are for a while. Here's a third option, though. Is there something else you can do to pay off those debts? I can tell you what I did. I delivered pizzas for a while. Um, I, I got in my, my nice car, put the Papa John's logo on top of my car, and delivered pizzas to pay off my, my credit cards. You could certainly do the same if you live in a city that has Uber. I think it's a great way to, to pay off uh, your debts, to be an Uber driver for a while, if you have a car that, that will allow you to do that, to deliver pizzas, to do something else that is going to allow you to still focus on your passion, but short term, put yourself in the situation that allows you to pay off your debts. And once you pay off those debts, never go back. Never go back in the debt because you want to maintain your freedom and you want to maintain your sense of, of security. And that real security comes from getting rid of those faux securities, those faux certainties that the trinkets, uh, uh, the 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 trinkets give give us in, in the moment. Our next question is from Nina. I have lived in several different countries, um, several different cities, and each time I moved to a new place, I tried to get rid of everything, and I literally want to live this hugely minimalist life where I have X amount of clothes, X amount of books, X amount of furniture, yet after a year, I feel like everything just accumulates all over again. And I don't want to have to wait until the next time I move to another city, be it for life or for work, to start anew, to start afresh. And I guess my question is, what can I do to get back to that point of inspiration of tossing everything, even though I'm technically not going anywhere yet? So your journey is ever evolving, and that's true for all of us, right? We're going to get a p to a point where we feel like, all right, I've simplified my life, and now I'm done. But you're never done. That's the cool thing about this whole experience. And I wrote about this. Uh, Nina, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. It's my favorite book of everything that we've done. And I wrote about my whole journey, and what I realized and uh, I wrote about this toward the end, is once I've simplified my life, there's always a new horizon. And so you're always working toward this ideal self. And, and you know, for me, I'm 34 years old. I aspire to be much more like my 35-year-old self or my 40-year-old self or my 50-year-old self. As I move toward the horizon, there's going to be a new horizon. And so as I simplify my life now, Circumstances change. I became a, a parent by proxy last year, and, and that circumstance has uh, allowed me to bring more things into my life for sure and question those things in a different way and also work with other people, my partner, Becca, and, and her daughter, Ella, and, and being willing to have you know, the conversations I would have never had to have by myself. And so I'm going to recommend a few just tips for you. If, if you get into a moment where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed and I've got all this extra stuff in my life and I had simplified before, but I've brought a bunch of stuff in. It's not add, adding value to my life. Ask yourself a few questions. Start with this one. How might my life be better with less? Now, if you ask that question, 
and you're honest with yourself, you're going to identify a bunch of benefits. Maybe it means, oh, I can travel more, or my place will be tidier, or I won't have to clean as much, or I can regain control of my finances, or I can regain control of my time, my relationships, my health. I'm going to have more time to explore my community. I'm going to have more time for me. I'm going to be able to meditate. What are the benefits for you? They're going to be different for all of us. And what are the main benefits? And focus on those. Right? By having less, I'm focusing on these because the point of getting rid of the stuff isn't getting rid of the stuff. We clear the clutter so we can make room for what's truly important. And once you've asked that question, take a look at your stuff and start asking another question. Does this add value to my life? And if you ask that question enough of all of your things, when I started simplifying, it took me about eight months to radically simplify my life. And it's because I kept asking that question over and over. I'd look at each artifact and say, does this thing add value to my life. And ever after I asked that a bunch of times, over and over and over, it became less of a, of a question and more of a feeling. And I was able to identify, does this serve a purpose for me? Does it bring me joy? And if not, I had to be willing to let go because I realized that my willingness to let go meant that those things could bring value to other people's lives. Just because I wasn't going to get value from it, that doesn't mean that someone else wouldn't. So my willingness to let go was really a willingness to give value to other people. Now, if you want some tactics, so those are some strategies. If you want some tactics, I'm going to recommend you start with something that we call the 30-day minimalism game. So if you've cluttered your life up again, let's, let's talk about this 30-day minimalism game. And you can see, we, we just posted a new uh, article on our website recently. We had a, a reporter up in Canada, uh, up in Edmonton. Alberta, Canada, who did the, the minimalism game, posted a video about it. So you can go to theminimalists.com slash W-A-G, which stands for what a game. And uh, this re- reporter, his name's Fish. He's a photographer and a reporter for the Edmonton Journal. And he documented his whole process for this 30 day, this 30 day period where he was letting go of all these things. And he, he, he really considered it to be an epiphonic experience. I, I feel like he he said it was cathartic and letting go let him learn a lot about himself. And it may have been terrifying at times, but it was also very meaningful and freeing. And that's what I want you to experience. It's something that's, that is freeing. And it's freeing because you know you're headed toward something better, better finances, better relationships, whatever it may be. You've got that, that ideal objective, that ideal life in mind, that horizon in line in mind, and you're just getting that stuff out of the way. It allows you to, to move uh uh, toward that horizon m- much more quickly. And and so once you've played the, the minimalism game, basically all, all you have to do is you grab a friend, family member, coworker, you start uh, at the beginning of a new month. So first day of the month, you each get rid of one item. On the second day of the month, two items. Third day of the month, three items. So it starts out really easy, but you get some momentum as as you 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 go on. That's what you need to start. But it gets much more difficult by day 15, where you're getting rid of 15 items on day 15, 16 items on day 16, and then you're like, wow, this is more and more difficult. Now, since you're playing with a friend, it makes it a little more fun, because decluttering is, I think, is pretty boring. Some people find it fun, and that's great. I think it's boring, and the way to make it more fun is with a little friendly competition. So whoever goes the longest in in this month wins. If you both make it to the end of the month, you both won because you've both gotten rid of about 500 items, and that's a hell of a start. We've had a lot of people who keep playing past day 31, so on day 35, they're getting rid of 35 items, so forth and so on. It's really up to you to determine your own rules and make it your own recipe for a, a more meaningful game. But we've had tens of thousands of people. You can check out the hashtag for that. It's just hashtag men's game, M-I-N-S-G-A-M-E on Twitter and especially on Instagram. Tons of photos there. You can share your own photos of, of the journey. And so that's one tactic. If you want to just dive in, you can do what Ryan did. He did a packing party, which is something I wish I would have done. He packed up all his stuff, pretended as if he was moving. He spent the next 21 days unpacking only the items he needed, and he found that he wasn't using, didn't find value in about 80% of his stuff, so he sold and donated pretty much all of it. And so I think that's uh, the more aggressive way to tackle your clutter, and that's great. And the third thing I would do, before you bring anything new into your life, start questioning those things up front. That's how you keep your life from getting cluttered, because the easiest way to organize your stuff is to get rid of most of it. And to get rid of most of it also means to bring fewer things in as you move forward.
Our next question is from Kristen. I've got an issue with my boyfriend's mother. Um, she's a giver, and every time we visit, which is about weekly, we end up coming home with something. And oftentimes it's great because she sends us home with groceries or other consumables. However, more often than not, because of her volunteer position at a local thrift shop, we end up with a lot of things we don't need. And I know she gives us things as a way of showing her love for us, but I'm so frustrated. My relationship with her is too new at this point for me to tell her flat out what I think of her gifts, but I've explained minimalism to her and how it makes my life better, yet she still sends bags full of unwanted items home with us. So I was just wondering if you had any advice on that point. It's an interesting question. The first thing is, yes, you do need to have a conversation, but not with her. That would be the worst thing you could do is have a conversation with your boyfriend's mother. The conversation that needs to be had needs to be with your boyfriend. You two need to get on the same page here. And he then needs to have a conversation with his mother. And that's what's important. And if he were the one calling in, I'd be giving him the same advice. And if it was your mother that was forcing stuff on him. Now, the conversation he needs, he needs to have isn't about don't get me stuff. It's about what you're getting. Instead of getting stuff, can we get experiences? Can we share something together? There's this concert that me and my boyfriend really want to go to. Let's go to that. You know, all, all of these, these experiences that you can have, and that way she can still feel like she's contributing because that's what she, she's trying to do here. She's thinking that gift giving, physical gift giving is a love language, but really the real love language is contribution. And so what she's trying to do is contribute to you in some way, show that she cares about you by giving it's just the gifts that you're getting, they aren't bringing any sense of joy. In fact, it's the opposite. They're draining the joy from your life and stressing you out because you have this point of contention right now. And if, uh, if your boyfriend has a good relationship with his mother, which it sounds like he has a great one, then it's going to be easy for him to have this conversation as long as he positions it as, here's what we would like going forward, not here's what we don't want, but here's what we do want. If you, if you phrase it in a positive way, you are going to, to get some positive results from that. And because uh, you're in Peoria, Illinois, one experience you can have is uh, see our documentary. Uh, the closest one to you, we have one in uh, Springfield. But I tell you what, I think we still have, Sean, we have some tickets left to um, our tour stop there in Chicago. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and send her uh, some tickets for her and her boyfriend. Uh, this is uh, for Kristen. And, and we'll be able to answer her questions in person. Maybe she, maybe they can bring uh, the mother as well. So let's send three tickets if, if we can and, and bring the mother. And we're happy to, to dish out some hugs while you're there also. We'll be in Chicago in, in May, and we hope you can join us. And if you can't, we'll, we'll send you some tickets to one of the other screenings. We have a bunch of them in Illinois right now. All right, uh, I would love to hear what you have to say about any of these, these voicemails. So if... if um, you have a comment or a minimalism tip for any of the people who called in today or just a random minimalism tip in general, uh, you can give us a call, 406-219-7839. We will air our favorite comments and tips on the next episode. And if your voicemail is selected, then we will send you a copy, uh, an autograph copy of one of our books, either Essential or Minimalism of a Meaningful Life or my personal favorite, Everything That Remains. I just want to say thank you real quick to everyone who has left uh, amazing, amazing iTunes comments for us. We really appreciate it, and uh, we're going to keep reading some of our favorites on air. So uh, keep your positive, honest, but also very creative iTunes comments uh, coming. <laughs> this one is from Sweet Cherish Cat. Ever since I discovered minimalism through the Minimalist blog, not surprisingly, I have been inspired to declutter my life in all aspects and, and return to simple, meaningful living. Joshua and Ryan do not preach their method within their podcast, but approach the subject and apply their recipe to real-life subject matter as if we all as if we are all just a couple of friends sitting in a quiet coffee shop. Oh, that, that's exactly what I want to do here, and that's why I'm doing this thing on Periscope right now. Sweet Cherish Cat, thank you. That, by the way, the, um, the title of this one was Advertisements Suck, But This Podcast Doesn't. Um, usually we start off our podcast. I didn't start it off today with some sort of disclaimer that this is 100% advertisement free. If you do want to support the podcast, you can go to theminimalist.com slash donate. Um, 
sweet cherished cat. Thank you. I'm going to send you a copy of everything that remains. And anyone else who has a comment, feel free to get really creative with it. We really appreciate it. Um, we read these comments not to be self-congratulatory. Uh, we're grateful that we're able to contribute, and it, it does mean a lot that, that you all are getting something from it. So thank you so much for uh, the value at, you add to our lives, and thank you for giving us this, this small opportunity to contribute to your lives in, in some way. If you do want to support the podcast, you can just go to theminimalist.com slash donate. But uh, there's no requirement there. We, we do have a lot of you who are certainly uh, supporting us. And uh, the rest of you, are, if you can't afford that, you absolutely get it for free and uh, advertisement free, which is also in, important to me. All right, let's move on to our hashtag Ask the Minimalists lightning round, where we answer uh, questions from social media. We are on Twitter and Instagram, and also on Periscope, right? We're on Periscope uh, at The Minimalists for all three of those platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope at The Minimalists. And uh, we're at, at facebook.com slash The Minimalists. I'm going to be answering questions from all of those platforms right now. And our first question, which I have right here, is from Lin Lee. These are long questions today. I pulled a lot of them from, from Facebook, and then the shorter ones are from Twitter and Instagram. Let's see here. Uh, Lynn Lee, she's in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Last episode, you talked about sentimental items. While I have very few, there are things I'm not sure I should keep or if it's okay to let go of. I have a, this huge piece of paper that represents the four and a half years I spent in college and the thousands of dollars spent on education, which I'm not using. It's not like I'm a doctor and I need to hang it on a wall to show my credentials or anything. So I don't see a reason for keeping my diploma. Is it okay to shred it? I mean, it's just a pa piece of paper, right? Uh, Lynn Lee, yes, it is just a pe piece of paper. And it sounds to me like you're looking for permission. And so you can keep this recording anytime uh, you you're feeling doubts. And anyone else can keep this recording as well. You have permission to let go. But you don't need my permission. You can have it if you want. What you need is your permission, and you have to be willing to let go. And you're right, it is a piece of paper. And even if you were a doctor, I can't tell you that any time I've, I've been to a doctor, and I've been to a lot of doctors in the last year, as Sean can attest to, um, I, I've been doing a lot of physical therapy and stuff for my back, and I can't tell you a single time I've walked in doctor's office and said, I need to see his credentials on the wall. Uh, that's going to help me determine you know, uh, whether or not I'm going to find this uh, a good experience. No, I, I don't need to see his diploma on the wall. What I need to see is what's his bedside manner. Is, is it congenial to my way of, of thinking and learning and interaction? And, and the same thing with you. This piece of paper is not you. You are you. And the best way to show who you are is through your consistent actions, not through hanging a piece of paper on the wall. So yeah, is it okay to shred it? Yeah, absolutely. If you're feeling uh, a, a bit apprehensive, trepidatious about that, then you know what? Take a picture of it first. That way you'll be able to store it digitally. You don't even have to take a picture of it. You can scan it as well. You could do what I did. It was called, called a scanning party, which you can read about at theminimalists.com slash scanning. Uh, but Lindley, I'll also send you a couple tickets to your closest screening of Minimalism, our documentary. Uh, anyone else can find that at minimalismfilm.com slash watch. You can find your closest theater there. Sarah says, I'm wondering if there's a market out there for, uh, for communities to share appliances and tools. For example, my neighbors try to find... Try to help clear snow from other drive from others' driveways if folks don't sh own snow blowers or shovels. That's really nice of them. That's a hell of a community that you live in there. Uh, have you run into communities like this? I'd love to get rid of larger tools and appliances that are cluttering our garage, but would also like to make those things available to others to borrow when needed. Yeah, there's a few few that I'm aware of, uh, two in, in particular. Uh, you can go to freecycle.org, and we'll put that in the show notes as well. Everything else I'm talking about today, Sean, we'll, we'll go ahead and throw in the show notes too. Any links or essays or things that I'm mentioning will be in the show, no show notes at theminimalists.com slash podcast. But um, 
yeah, in terms of tools, FreeCycle is, is a great way, FreeCycle.org. And then um, we were in Albuquerque for a tour stop a few years ago, and we had a guy come up to us and say, I use Craigslist as my storage locker. He said, if I need a chainsaw, I just go to Craigslist, find a chainsaw, and then and, you know, he'll pay 20 25 bucks for it or whatever it may be. And then when he is done with that chainsaw, he'll put it back in his storage locker, which is Craigslist, and he'll re- repost it and resell it on Craigslist. And for big uh, appliances like that, you're going to use once a year, uh, or, or tools, I should say, not appliances would fit too. Um, that's certainly something you can do. I'd love to hear what other people say too. I'm sure there are other websites and apps out there uh, that you can share with me. So you can give us a call and leave a comment on our voicemail, 406-219-7839. Love to hear your tips on that too. A star in Alberta, Canada, star asks, my question involves sharing space with someone who is on the journey but struggling a bit. Uh, We've been completely overhauling our lives the last six months, getting rid of anything that isn't of value, reevaluating our family values and moving toward a quieter, slower existence with an emphasis on building our relationships with ourselves and our kids. The only thing that scares my husband is getting rid of internet at the house. Uh Aha. I am there right now, ready to cancel cable and internet, and save it. that saves us 150 bucks a month to do so, but he still enjoys playing his video games. I, I'm reading this with scorn, because it sounds like she, he still likes his video games. Here, here it comes. He plays video games that require an internet connection for streaming. I appreciate your podcast, where you talk about going to coffee shops to use internet, etc., and it became a light bulb moment for me. There's so much free internet, why am I paying for it? Well, there's no such thing as free internet. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's like saying they're getting free college education. There's no such thing as free. Um, uh, There's so much free internet, why am I paying for it? Uh, I've been having a lot of conversations about about what it is about the games, what their purpose is for him. Ooh, that's probably a bad way to approach it. Uh, he He readily admits he doesn't like how manipulative the video games are in respect to keeping players hooked. Uh huh. And he agrees that it's wasted time. Okay. Uh, that's good. So he agrees with you there. And even reading a book has more value. Sometimes it does. Yeah. Um, there is actually, there's some neuroscience. I'm so, I used to be very anti video game the last, you know, 15, 20 years of my life. I used to love it as, as a pacifier in my teens and early twenties. But, um, uh, there's a lot of actually neuroscience now that shows some video games, especially uh, like puzzle piece kind of games like Tetris, um, can help your, your cognitive function improve. Uh, even games like, like Call of Duty aren't inherently bad. Uh, I, I've never played Call of Duty myself, but I, I know what it is, and I've seen other people play it. And there are there, there's a book um, called Super Better I've mentioned before, but we'll throw a link to that in the show notes as well. Especially people who have received brain damage or trying to, uh, or who have brain brain damage or trying to receive treatment, um, there are video games that can help with that. But you're right; it, it's very uh, it can be a pacifier sometimes. Let me continue with her question, which is the longest of them. And I would say that he is an equal partner in deciding how our family is changing the future. Uh, we are moving toward. Good. What can I do to support his journey in a way that respects his needs as well as my own? I'm more of a cold turkey kind of person, so cutting the internet all at once is what works for me. But I'm hesitant to do do it if my husband isn't ready. Um, suggestions? Yes. Let, let, put your money where your mouth is here. If you really are the type of cold turkey person, just have him change the Wi-Fi password. That way you can't get it on the internet, but your household still can. You don't want to deprive others in your household. That's not a way to get them to follow you. You want to lead by example. So by removing that connection yourself and, and, and being militant about it for yourself, what you're going to do is allow, uh, allow them to see the benefits, not just the application, not just the action of removing the internet. So what you're referring to is uh, a few years ago when I moved uh, to a new small, I was trying to pay off all my debt, so I moved to this small apartment in Dayton, Ohio, which you can see at the minimalists.com slash apartment. You can see what 500 bucks a month gets you in Dayton, Ohio, which is a, a relatively decent apartment for one person. And, um, you know, I, I got rid of internet for a month and as a, a, an experiment. And it was the most productive month I ever had. And I ended up never getting internet at home. And that was maybe four years ago. I think it was back in, in 2011. Yeah. And I never went back because it was so productive. In fact, I, I live in Montana now. I still don't have internet at home. 
Now, one of the benefits was I, will, I, I did save about 30 bucks a month, 40 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month. <laughs> Uh, I don't even know what internet costs now. It's probably $80 a month now uh, for good internet in some places, 100 bucks a month. Um, I did save that money, but that's not why I did it. Uh, money was not the primary driver, and generally it's not the primary driver for doing what I want to do unless I'm trying to get out of debt, trying to get out of that crater, right? And so I found that I, um, I, I was more interested in Re- regaining and retaining my focus and internet was getting in the way I would get lost in that Bermuda Triangle of YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and actually it wasn't even Instagram at the time it was Twitter and and I would get stuck in, in that in that loop and so I now keep my phone in one very specific place as soon as I get home it goes on a charging dock and anytime I need to use it I have to get up from wherever I am and and go to that charging dock to send a text message or a phone call or whatever and and so uh, I would encourage that as an experiment and you may find that you're actually depriving yourself if you get rid of internet for a month give it a month though if, you, if you're really wanting to do it and, and you can go elsewhere I at the office right now so I have internet access here I plan my internet time now and that's certainly something you can do, whether it's a coffee shop or I, we have an office here. Uh, so we do pay for internet here. Uh, we, we pay for this office and it, it comes to, it's part of that, that expense. And so uh, I didn't do it because it was free, saving a little bit of money at home because if I had internet at home right now, I'd be spending a little bit more money on that uh, was a nice benefit, but it wasn't the reason I did it. I wanted to do it because I wanted to start focusing on, on my values. And I found this was often getting in the way of that. Uh, Jasmine in Minneapolis writes, focusing on relationships is a major component of the minimalist lifestyle, but how would you approach a toxic relationship with a very close family member? Sometimes cutting even parents or siblings out of life is necessary, but I'm struggling to reconcile eliminating a toxic relationship versus using my additional time and resources to rebuild that relationship. Interesting. So I wrote an essay uh, about, about this topic called Goodbye Fake Friends. You can find that at theminimalists.com slash fake, also in the show notes to this episode. And you know what? I'll, I haven't read anything today, so let me go ahead and read that, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, Jasmine's question here. Dear fake friends from my past, when I walked away from a successful career three years ago, you thought I was crazy. Even crazier when I said I wanted to cultivate my passion, pursue my dream, writing. It's all right. There's no need to to deny it now. Save your apologies. I'm not looking for one. Scores of you, my ostensible friends, talked behind my back. The grapevine is not self-contained. So yes, I heard the terrible things you said about me. You said I was dumb, out of touch, too idealistic. You gossiped. You told people I'd lost my mind. I was an idiot, you said. Lost. I'd be broke and alone in no time. It was upsetting, gut-wrenching, and heart-rending to hear the vitriol. I thought you were different. I thought we were different. I thought we were friends. You, my lip service friends, told me it was impossible If people could make a living from their passions, you said, then everyone would be doing it. I was making a mistake, a horrible decision, you said. I'd regret giving up the money, the status, the ostensible success. My plan would never work. It's evident now you were projecting your own fears, hoping I would fail so your flawed idea of success would remain unblemished. I don't regret it. My change in lifestyle, it all worked out, and then some. My life is better now, substantially better, be it money, passion, health, growth, contribution. My life has improved exponentially. Even my friends are better, my real friends. Although they may have not fully understood my decisions at the time, they supported me through the transition. Real support. They encouraged me, cheered me on, offered help when I needed it. It took this radical change to recognize my real friends and to recognize those just hanging on because I had an impressive job title or the shiny things they wanted. Without the facade of a big paycheck or an oversized house, 
I made new friends, people whose interests, values, and beliefs align with mine. Wonderful people who care about me for me, not for what's printed on my business card. So, goodbye, fake friends of old. I'm walking away for good, and you won't be able to catch up. Before I go, though, I want to thank you for teaching me one of life's most important lessons. You can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. So let me just expand on that real quick. Um, You can't change the people around you, but you can change the people around you. Sometimes I find it necessary to surround myself with people whose values are similar to mine. We may have radically different personalities. We may have radically different beliefs. Uh, I'm not a particularly religious person, but uh, many of my my closest friends are uh, Christians or or pastors even, or Buddhists, um, or radical atheists. I wouldn't consider myself an atheist either. I, I, I just... I don't have a term for what I am, really, and and I don't I don't need one. But you might have a radically different belief template. But we're getting to the, it's just a different road that gets us to the same place. It gets us to our same values, and, and, and people I surround myself with now are much more focused on on contributing. They're much much more focused on growing. They're, they're focused on being the best version of themselves, and that means a lot of times I had to let go of crappy relationships in my life. So Jasmine, yes, I would encourage you to reallocate your time to more meaningful relationships. Those are harder to find, but they're easier to find than ever uh, because we have more tools at our disposal, whether that's the internet, you can go to minimalist.org. That's the, and we do have a, a Minneapolis chapter and we have a hundred chapters, in fact, all over the world, eight, eight different countries. Uh, where we ha- connect open-minded, like-minded people. It's absolutely free. We don't want anything from you. It's just a way that we can contribute and, and have meetup groups, free local meetup groups in 100 different cities. So you can find those at minimalist.org. You can go to meetup.com. You can go to Twitter, which I've met a lot of my closest friends on Twitter. I, I know that sounds like it's hard to believe until you actually start to do it. And what you'll find is you have only 24 hours in a day. So really, it's not about just pushing those friends out of your life, it's about reallocating your time to people who share similar values to you. And sometimes you do, however, have to have difficult conversations. If people gossip to you, they gossip about you. And that's a lesson I learned. And if people in my life start to gossip to me, I, I realize that they're probably also saying things behind my back. And, and those are relationships that uh, I'm willing to let go of, and that means spending less time or no time at all with those people because my time is very important. We have three types of relationships. We wrote about this in uh, our book, uh, Minimalism, Live a Meaningful Life. It's in the relationship chapter of that. The The types of relationships we have are primary, secondary, and, and uh, the tertiary relationships, or the uh, I would call the relationships on the periphery. The most important relationships in our life, those are the primary relationships. You can count those on one hand, usually. If you're an introvert like me, you still have a few digits left. Uh, if you're a Catholic, you might ha- count them on two hands because you have a big family. But you know what? If it, Those are the people who you're closest to. And, and the secondary relationships, those are still people you love, people you care about, extended family, close friends, uh, co-workers you really, really love. And then you have these, these, the third layer of relationships, the, the tertiary relationships, the people on the periphery, uh, co-workers, acquaintances, networking buddies, friends in the community, uh, just different people. They're still good people and you care about them, but they're relationships in your life. I found that for the longest time, I was spending so much time in that third tier that I didn't have enough time for the people closest to me. And so in order to change that, I had to reprioritize my relationships. The people who were in that first tier, I had to start treating them like they were in the first tier and prioritizing, putting all of my time and attention toward them first, then whatever time was left over, spending that with the, the secondary tier, and then anything that was left over from that, then moving on to the, the tertiary tier. And so you're going to have to find that pe- people will change tiers over time. I know my best friend from the, the first grade still isn't my best friend. Uh, although, uh, the interesting thing is, my, my best friend from high school is still my best friend now, I mean, w- with Ryan. And so some people stick around in their same tiers. In fact, I, although in my early 20s, Ryan moved to that, that secondary tier 
or even the tertiary tier for for a period of time. And we wrote about that in the same book, where, where you know we uh, he went one direction after high school. I went a separate direction, and that was okay. It's not like we we didn't like each other or anything like that. We we just sort of drifted apart for a while, but then we drifted back together. And that's the cool thing is. If you're deliberate about how you change these tiers, you can allocate your time to the people who are most important to you, and that will allow you to to weed out the people who no longer share your values. Sometimes, however, it does require sitting down and having a conversation with someone and saying, look, this relationship is no longer adding value to my life. Um, here's what needs to change. I don't need you to change, but in our relationship, here's what's going to have to change in order for me to keep this relationship in my life. It's a difficult conversation to have, but it's certainly one that's worthwhile. Our next question is from Casey. I am in the process of decluttering, but I am having a hard time letting go of items, not for sentimental reasons, but for environmental reasons. I want the stuff gone, but I feel so guilty throwing everything away. I donate as much as possible to Goodwill, but uh, some stuff I am stuck on. It isn't, it isn't really fit to be donated, but I don't want to create more trash either. Uh, do you have any resources for donating, recycling, or repurposing items? Uh, or any thoughts to help uh, reconcile my cluttering and zero waste tendency, my decluttering and zero waste tendencies. Uh, yeah, so, so first off, uh, you can go to donationtown.org. There's a bunch of resources there in terms of donating. Now, um, I just want to be clear here. Ryan and I advocate responsible decluttering, responsible letting go. You often hear us use the word trash something, but we don't mean it literally. Like, yeah, I just want to trash all my stuff or trash all your stuff. No, like that's not, we don't mean like run a dumpster and throw all your things in it. What we mean is letting go of it. And and just like on your computer, you know, often you have the, the trash bin. I'm looking at mine right now. It just says trash. It's not literally trash. It's not filling up a landfill somewhere. However, I also want you to realize this is not a binary solution. This isn't zero. I'm not an advocate of zero waste either. I'm an advocate of, of much, much, much less waste. And, and the way that we produce less waste in our lifetime is by consuming less going forward. And, and that's, that's what's important. The things we have now, they can, you can do three things with. Try to sell them, especially big, big ticket items that help me get out of debt, especially if you're, you're in debt. You can find a way to sell them on Craigslist or eBay or a bunch of different apps that people have recommended on, on different episodes. And if you have another way to, to, to donate or sell your stuff, I'm, I'm Looking forward to hearing about it on our voicemail line. Uh, but you can also, you, you, so you can sell your stuff, you can donate it, uh, whether it's the Goodwill, um, you, you can donate it to a local place as well that you can find from donationtown.org. I avoid donating to um, Salvation Army because their, their values don't align with mine uh, personally. Uh, there's some, uh, they, they've done some, some pretty egregious things. It doesn't mean the people, the, the organ, everyone at the organization is bad, but they've done some uh, pretty egregious things toward uh, non-traditional marriage, I guess you, you would call it, uh, and anyone who... Who, who lives a, a, a sort of non-traditional or, or uh, a lifestyle that, that isn't a uh, just a heterosexual lifestyle. Um, and so that uh, I find the, those actions deplorable. And so I, I go out of my way to support places that do align with my values. I've had people complain to me before because I, do, I do donate to goodwill sometimes. They say, but the CEO makes a million dollars a year. Well, I'm, I'm not against money. And, and so if a CEO does a phenomenal job of creating value for uh, a bunch of different communities around the world, I don't think that's inherently bad that, that he, he makes money. I certainly don't make a million dollars a year, and, and that's not my goal in, in life. But if he's creating far more value than that, uh, I don't think it's inherently bad. That said, I do go out of my way to support local uh, places much more. And so we have a bunch of uh, organizations here in Missoula. We have a donation warehouse. We have some thrift shops here that I'll donate, donate clothes to. And, and you can find alternatives to, to Goodwill as well. And so the third thing is, yeah, sometimes you do have to trash things. Uh, sometimes their, their home is in, in the trash. But that's far and few between. I found that far less than 10% of the things that I owned actually ended up making it into the trash when I was decluttering. Now, again, it's not advocating for a, a zero-waste lifestyle, but if I were to take 100% of my things and throw it away, that's going to produce far more waste than 3 to 10% of my things that actually ended up in, 
in the the trash. So it's about being more deliberate. And the few things we do trash, yes, I understand that 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 is going to take its toll if everyone um, throws away everything they have. But if you're removing a few bits of, of clutter that you've really determined can't make it anywhere else, they're not going to add value to anyone else's life and you're going to throw it away, that's okay once you've made that deliberate decision. So my, my takeaway from this would be make the most deliberate decision possible with those things. Sell it, donate it, and if you must, because no one else is going to get value from it, then you can decide to trash it, and then you can feel good about letting it go because you were very intentional about that decision. Jesse asks, silverware and dishes, should we just have one per family member? What about guests? I um, remember growing up, I had some friends. They had this large Catholic family um, uh, back in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, they, the dad was like a total prankster. And so they had six boys. It was uh, uh, Jim and Tara and, and their six boys. And they'd have eight place settings around the table. Well, one of the boys would bring a date over, you know, when they were growing up in high school or whatever. And, and to play a joke... They would just set out eight, eight plates still, and the dad, Jim, would just scoop yeah, all of the, the green beans and the meatloaf or whatever right onto the table and eat right there from the table. Um, no, I'm not advocating that you do that, uh, but there are solutions to everything. Maybe the question, maybe if I were to rephrase the question, let's say you have enough for four guests right now. So you already have, you have four people in your household. I have no idea how many people you have in your household, Jesse. Let's say you have four people in your household, and you have four extra sets for four more guests. What happens if you have five guests come over? Well, you don't have enough, right? What happens if you have 10 guests come over? You eventually, you're going to reach a threshold. You don't want to plan for every scenario, is my point. Now, me, I have a few extra plates, a few extra bowls, uh, but I also realize that I, I have a stack of uh, compostable plates as well. So if I have extra guests that come over, we'll do one of two things. I'll break out a compostable plate if I absolutely need it because I've used up all of my dishware. Or, um, and I've had a lot of people get a lot of value from this, uh, BYOP. You bring your own plate. And if we're having a big dinner or something, bring your own plate. It's just like you're going to bring some food as well. I've had people bring their own plate. Uh, we did this for, for Christmas uh, two years ago. And we didn't have enough plates for everyone that we, we brought over. Ryan and I were, were living together at the time. And um, we we just had people bring their own plates. And it worked out just fine. And people actually thought it was kind of cool. And they liked it. And they thought, oh, that's a good idea. I should do this too. So no, have what's enough for you. And you have, you have to answer that question yourself. Ask yourself, what what is enough? And, and once you determine what enough is for you, don't try to plan for every scenario. You, you're not planning for the in-laws to come over and then your parents to come over and they're going to bring their dog. And, oh, what about, uh, what about my great aunt? Is she going to show up this year? You're not going to plan for every scenario. So for, plan for what happens on a daily basis, what's likely going to happen in a short period of time. Maybe use the 90-90 rule. Is it, has it happened in the last 90 days? Is it going to happen in the next 90 days? And if not, then, then you know what? Once in a blue moon, you might have to break out the combustible uh, plates. You might have to, to, to have someone bring their own plate or something, and that's totally fine. They're not there because they love how great your plates look. They're there because they want to share uh, an experience with you. Connor in Toronto says, Hi, I'm 16 years old. I'm living in Toronto, and I listen to your podcast every week. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I want to know how I can help my family adapt to my minimalist lifestyle. Aha. Both my parents like keeping old bills and trinkets and other useless objects, quote, just in case. What should I do? And how can I help them adjust to how I want to live? (laughs) Um, uh, You can't help someone who doesn't want help. There's a person drowning in the river be very careful to jump in after them because they might drag you down with them. Now, I don't think that's the case here with, with Connor. You can show them the benefits. Ultimately, that's, what it, that's the only thing you can do is show them how the, your minimalist lifestyle is improving your life, and they may pick up a few ingredients from your recipe and apply it to their own lives. But if they find value in, in all this other stuff, you're not going to be able to change them. And in fact, I would encourage you not to try to change them. You can help them only if they want help. So maybe the first question to ask is, do they want help? 
And maybe you're going to have to ask them that. Now, it sounds to me like maybe maybe there's some point of, of contention or discontent there. And maybe if the stuff is a, a point of discontent, then you can offer help. Maybe that's a doorway into offering help and expressing the benefits. And then you can start asking them those questions. How might your life be better with less? Help them identify what the benefits are going to be for them. Connor, you can also bring both your parents to our tour stop in Toronto. We're going to send you a couple tickets to, to that. It's on June 1st in Toronto. Um, we're going to more than a dozen cities. So join us there and bring your parents, and we'll answer, answer any questions they have. Hopefully they'll enjoy the, the documentary and also the live version of the podcast there in Toronto. It's our last stop of the tour. Adam in Scotland asks, do you have a single personal quote that resonates with you more than any other quote? I like Henry David Thoreau in Walden. He wrote, it's not enough to be busy. The question is, what are you busy about? And if I were to append that quote, I would say, the question is, what are you focused on? Because busy is the opposite of focus. And to me, it's the worst four-letter word that we have in our language. We stay busy, 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 but we don't accomplish anything. We're constantly checking our email and Facebook and doing things that make us feel productive, that ape the form of productivity, but aren't actually productive to us at all. And so I have found that I like to be less busy, and I like to be more focused on what I'm doing. And so people ask me all the time, how do you get so much done? Because I do way less. Now, that sounds counterintuitive, but really means I focus on less, and I'm able to get more meaningful things done, as opposed to just running around like a chicken with his head cut off. The rat race, right? The thing about the rat race is if you win the rat race, you are still a rat. And so focus a lot more, be busy a lot less. Dinesh asks, what are your views on religion as a minimalist? Well... Ryan and I have two different views on minimalism, so if you're asking me, I'm not particularly religious. And what I, the nice thing I found about um, minimalism is it coincides with a bunch of different religious beliefs. We were in Mississippi for our last tour, and a guy came up to us afterward and gave us a big hug and said, you know what, guys, it's just so great to see a couple guys out here spreading Jesus' message. And I thought, wow, okay, I... That's interesting. There are definitely some parallels there, right? Absolutely. In fact, um, some of my friends are pastors, and so that makes sense. We have similar values. Okay. And then we were in Seattle, and, and, and this woman came up to us afterwards, and she gives us a big hug, and she goes, I'm just so happy to see a couple of Buddhists out here spreading these Buddhist maxims with the world. I said, huh, interesting. A lot of parallels there, right? And then, uh, Dinesh, we got an email from someone who said, did you, did you know that Muhammad is the original minimalist? I said, oh, no, I didn't know that, but that's interesting. But I think it actually goes back before Muhammad. If you go back and look at the Stoics, you look at someone like Epictetus or Seneca or Marcus Aurelius, you have all of these different people who live radically different lives. In the case of Epictetus, he used to be a slave, and he was focused on intentional living. Or you had Marcus Aurelius, who was the most powerful, most wealthiest man in the world, also asking similar questions as a former slave, a broke person. And so uh, the Stoics, who, who uh, espouse the virtues of, of living a more intentional life. And so I find that minimalism coincides with, with any set of religious beliefs, uh, because it, it is much more about these values and I don't think that the, I don't think those values can be uh, ascribed to any one particular uh, religion. There's a lot of overlap between all of them. And while I may not may not share your specific beliefs, we may have very similar values. Pab asks, "How different would your life be if you were practicing minimalism from birth?" It's interesting. We're all born the ultimate minimalists, aren't we? We come out of the womb naked, and and. Uh, it's interesting. Then we turn into the opposite of a minimalist pretty quick. Now, not, not just with the, the acquisition of stuff, although the stuff is forced onto us right away from our parents, right? Because that's the society we're in. But minimalism, if you just take away that word for a minute, you talk about what it is, it's about being intentional. Intentionalism is maybe another word for it. And if I'm being more intentional with the stuff that I bring into my life and with the decisions I make, well, that's the opposite of a toddler. You know, I was... 
Uh, I, I was with Ella this morning. We were we were putting a puzzle together, and all of a sudden, she just decided it was like these these building blocks, uh, a puzzle. All of a sudden, she just looked at it and thought it was curious to knock the whole thing over. And she's two years old, and that's the opposite of intention, right? We act on impulse. And then it's weird because we start to learn that acting on impulse isn't the best way to do it because we act on impulse, it hurts others, it isn't best for us long term, it isn't best for our happiness, it isn't best for the happiness of others, it isn't best for the greater good to just act on impulse. But then, of course, as we, we grow up and, and we, again, start acting on impulse, we, this impulse manifests differently. It's not knocking the blocks over. It's, oh, I'm going to buy this thing that I saw at the checkout line. Uh, oh, I'm going to acquire this new object. I'm going to shop impulsively, impulsive buying, uh, impulsive decision making. And that gets us into a world of trouble as well. And so I think we're all born minimalist in the sense that we, we don't have this problem with consumption. In fact, it's interesting. I, I was thinking about this recently. Ella just we, we, when we eat dinner together, she has this, uh, it's me, and there's, we just have three chairs at this bar area, and we don't have a dining room there or anything like that. There's nothing wrong with the dining room, but it's not like Ella ever looks at us and says, where's our dining room? Like, that is a construct. We, we've been told that, like, that's a thing that we're supposed to have. And in many cases, it does augment our experience. It's a, it's a good tool, but it's not a, a, a requirement. It's not a necessity. Uh, and so whenever we build a house or we do anything that is uh, uh, sort of a cultural norm, we start having these things. In our documentary, we interviewed a, a, um, a minimalist architect named Frank. And he, he, said, he said to me when we were recording the interview, this part didn't make the film, but he, he was talking about um, – When he builds a house for someone, he never asks them, do you want a dining room? Do you want a living room? How many bedrooms do you want? Because you're going to get the standard answers. Yes, I want a living room. I have to have a living room, and I have to have a a, a dining room and a kitchen, and I have to have these things. Instead, he asks, how do you live your life? And he builds a house around their life, what's appropriate for them. For some people, a dining room is totally appropriate. And uh, personally, I prefer having a, a dining room myself uh, because I like, that's where I like to work more so than having a, a separate office. I like having a s- sort of communal, sp- communal space where I can work. And, but it's not a requirement for everyone. And so the question is, what is appropriate for your life? And so if I would have been a minimalist since birth to answer Pab's question, I would have acted more intentionally throughout my lotus eating 20s. And, and I probably would have made better decisions and been farther along on a path now. I'm grateful for the experiences I've had and learned. But you often hear people say, I would never go back and change anything. Well, that's silly. If you have the experience of, of before, if you're able to retain the experience and still go back and change stuff, yeah, I, w- I would change a lot. I, I would live more intentionally. I would be more in the moment. I'd be more focused. I'd surround myself with more supportive people who are like-minded, open-minded, and have, have similar values. Uh, Lucia in Panama asks, could you comment on the importance of enjoying being on your own instead of always being surrounded by people? Um, Being alone. I love being alone. I am an introvert. So I would answer this question differently if I was Ryan. Ryan is an extreme extrovert. And so he uh, loves being around people all the time. That's where he gets his energy from. And that's awesome. For me, I get drained by being around people. And and so I have to recharge more frequently uh, than him. And so I'm going to read an essay for you, uh, last one I will read today. This one is called Alone Time. You can find it in the show notes to this as well. I'm walking through a city in the deep south today, alone, but not lonely. I used to think there was something wrong with me. Throughout my 20s, I followed societal norms, doing all the things you're supposed to do to be a normal, functioning member of society. Going out with coworkers after work, spending every evening and weekend with friends, killing time with vapid small talk, always engaged, always on, never alone. But this constant interaction wore me out. Often I wasn't pleasant to be around. It felt oddly alone to never be alone. Then as my 20s twilighted, I discovered I was more affable when I carved out time for myself. After all, I'm an INTJ. And there's a link here in the essay as to what an INTJ is. It's a type of personality. Uh, but don't worry. This isn't a platitudinal reminder to make time for yourself. Rather, 
It's a reminder to embrace your individualism, your personality. Today, I spend copious amounts of time by myself. In fact, I don't know anyone who spends more time alone than me. At least 80% of my time is spent solo, walking, writing, exercising, reading, ruminating. In the process, I've, enjoyed, I've learned to enjoy the sound of silence, to sit quiet, quietly and hear what's going on, not just around me, but inside myself. Yet the greatest benefit of prolonged solitude is that when I do decide to immerse myself in social situations, be it a dinner with friends, a date, or on tour, I'm pretty awesome to be around. Not only do I benefit from my alone time, but everyone around me benefits too. We all get the best version of me. I'm able to burst into social situations with stored energy, which actually makes most people believe I'm an extrovert since I'm able to engage at a high level and employ active listening, humor, and intellectually stimulating conversation. I don't, however, recommend more alone time or more social time to anyone. It's not one size fits all. So what works for me may not work for you. Take Ryan, for example. As an ENFP, there's also a link there to to what that means, his personality is nearly the obverse of mine. He spends more time around people than anyone else I know. He's the life of the party, naturally charismatic, funny, and likable. Uh, By nature, he's always on. As an extrovert, he actually gets his energy from other people, and time alone exhausts him. But classifying his approach or my approach as the right or wrong approaches misses the point. Both approaches can be right or wrong, depending on your personality, which, of course, is a continuum. Even I, in my my extroverted ways, would hate to be Sentenced to perpetual solitary confinement, just as Ryan in his charming extroversion occasionally needs a break from his socialite lifestyle. Ultimately, whether introvert or extrovert, man or woman, young or old, I recommend learning more about yourself. Once you better know yourself, you can grow by easing into your discomfort zone. Um, I also have, a, at the end of that essay, you can find a, a Myers-Briggs test, personality test. By learning more about myself, I've been able to improve my interactions with other people. So learning more about my own personality, it allows me to interact better with the world around me. I would encourage you to, to uh, do the same thing. And so alone time for me is important, but uh, Lucia in, in Panama, I'm not going to prescribe alone time to you. What I'm going to say is learn your personality, learn more about yourself, and learn what the appropriate amount of alone time is for you. Uh, My partner, uh, Bex, she is an introvert as well. She's not nearly as introverted as I am, but she's pretty introverted, but she doesn't need as much alone time as me, and and she needs more uh, more time around more people, and that's great. And, And learning that allows her to be the best version of herself as well. Our last question is from Dan Conrad in Washington, D.C. What would you tell your 18-year-old self? I think it's a great place to end, actually, right? So, so Dan, let me send you a couple tickets to our D.C. tour stop, which actually might be close to sold out at this point. I think we're doing two, two screens there, so you may get tickets to the, the second one. Uh, Before I answer Dan's question, though, uh, I'm going to just do a quick version of our added value segment of of the podcast. This is where usually Ryan and I will endorse something or or recommend something that has added value to our lives recently or maybe an activity we're doing or, or something like that. I am going to recommend donating, not to our podcast, but donating to places that uh, add value to your life in some way. I just went through and did my li- latest round of doing this. So I listen to a bunch of different podcasts, whether it's uh, Sam Harris or Radio Lab or uh, Rob Bell or The Brilliant Idiots or, uh, I mean, I listen to dozens of podcasts. You can see my list of some of my favorites at uh, theminimalists.com slash FP, which stands for Favorite Podcasts, FP. Uh, and what I did recently is anyone that has an opportunity for me to donate to them, I go through and, and donate a few bucks. Or in some cases where I get an immense value from it, I will donate. You know, what would I pay for this podcast? I, I recently donated a couple hundred bucks to, to Sam Harris's podcast. 
because I get immense value from that over the course of a year. Is it worth uh, 200 bucks? I've listened to it for two years now. Is it worth uh, you know $100 a year to me? Yeah, I, I would probably pay that. I, I get immense value from, from a lot of these. But a lot of them, I'll just go donate two bucks, three bucks, five bucks, and it adds up for me. But I get immense value from those things. I don't have to pay a subscription or anything like that. So find something that adds value to your life, whether it's a podcast or a blog or something, and see if there's a way to contribute. And even if it's not a way to contribute to them directly, what are some of the charities or causes that they contribute to as well? Ryan and I, thanks to uh, help from you all, were able to build an elementary school last year. We were able to fund a high school last year. We were able to um, build some clean water wells in, in Malawi, which was amazing. I mean, literally life-saving and, and so we've been able to do a lot of things like that because uh, a lot of you have been willing to, to support our efforts in contributing to the world around us. So find a way to contribute. That's what I'm going to recommend. And I'm going to recommend that uh, you do the same thing, find a way to, to contribute to the things that add value to your life. And a few things of what's going on with us, what we, a segment we call Right Here, Right Now. I already mentioned minimalismfilm.com. You can find uh, our tour. You can find the trailer, which is amazing. I hope you've checked it out already. And you can find where it's playing in a theater near you over at minimalismfilm.com. And then just click on See the Film, and you can find all that there. Also, every Tuesday in uh, March and April of 2016, we are doing Tuesdays with the Minimalists. It's where Ryan and I get on Periscope and Twitter live for about an hour and do lightning round question and answer session. It's a live video broadcast where Ryan and I will answer your questions live on Twitter and Periscope. We are at the Minimalists. Also, I'm teaching a writing class, as many of you know, but I have a one-day workshop. Many of you can't uh, spare the time to do a four-week writing class with me online. If you can, great. You can find details of that at howtowritebetter.org. But if you want a one-day workshop, I had hundreds of people attend this one last month. And so um, I'm doing another one, June 26, 2016. It's a limited seating. You can find all the details at howtowritebetter.org. And um, Sean, this will be the section where you can paste in. I've got some voicemail comments here. Um, you can paste all of those in and the final edit of this. So I will pause right now and let you all listen to some comments and minimalism tips from our uh, listeners. Hey, Josh and Ryan. This is Paul from Dallas, Texas. I wanted to call and leave a comment about your sentimental podcast. You guys talked about um, Jim Morrison and those guys that sort of dropped all of their info or all of their information that they had, um, all of their journals and stuff that they built up. I want to say that George Carlin also did that as well. He scrapped all of his material for a year and that gave him a totally blank slate and it forced him to work harder in order to build that up. Hello, this is Tierney in Oregon. I follow you guys on Facebook TheMinimalist.com, and now I'm really enjoying your podcast. This is a follow-up question for podcast episode number three. During the lightning round, there was a question about making decisions on getting rid of books that made me think of this suggestion. I think a great future podcast topic would be about free public resources for books and media, such as the public library. It is curious to me how many people I query about their local libraries do not even own a library card. Our smallest town library has endless books, movies, music, online audiobooks, Kindle book loans, online free downloads, online and iPad magazine reads, online movies, all for free. Why own a lot of books and media when you can just borrow or download it for free from your library? Hi, this is Joe. I'm from the Dayton, Ohio area. I was just calling about the sentimental uh, podcast I just heard. And one comment I had on one of the first um, callers that you aired, she had some heirlooms, family heirlooms that her daughter liked, but she really had no value for them or use for them. And I had one idea that I think could be mentioned is to maybe take those items to a jeweler, um, some kind of artistic jeweler that could recreate using that material something that she would use. Um because obviously she holds some value to it if she hasn't thrown it out yet. Uh, if you have a, a voicemail comment or question for us, 406-219-7839, we'd love to hear your questions, especially your comments. We air far more um, 
uh, comments and we do questions. We, we just get a ton of questions. And so if you have tips for our, our listeners, we'd love to hear your tips. We're always looking for, for new tips. Ryan and I don't have all the answers, but uh, collectively between the hundreds of thousands of people who listen to this and, and, and Ryan and myself, we may be able to come up with most of the answers, which is pretty awesome. So thanks for sharing your tips. And you can just give us a call. And Dan, your question, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. I'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for and you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it so tear your eyes away, or tear.